Today we're going to pick up where we left off on Monday <clears throat> with finishing up the valuation of PVH. So you're going to need to follow along in class from where you turned in your last homework assignment, homework three. And as I said today, uh, we'll be creating and finishing the valuation of PVH, which will be part of homework four. We're also going to do a couple of different versions of the valuation called an as is, a target, a bull, and a bear. <clears throat> so it'll be those four files, which I'll explain more in class later, that you're going to turn in for homework four next Monday. So your goal is to continue following along, recreating what we do. And then, like I said, on Wednesday, this class will likely finish up the valuation of PVH. And then the other homework assignment that was due for today was you had to export the data for L Brands with no zeros in it. So it's very important that you not only export the data correctly, but you had no zeros. And just to highlight that solution, because uh, I got a couple of emails about this over the weekend, but basically if you did L Brands and you went to FA <coughs> and then you went to the custom screen and you did your model export because L Brands have reported their fiscal 2018 fiscal year, then you should have actually had 2013 through 2018 data. And as I said, when you exported it, you'd have had to get rid of all the dashes with zeros. Okay, but that would have been the L Brands assignment. Right? So today, again, we're not valuing L Brands yet. You can guess that's probably coming up. But regardless, today we're going to focus on PVH. All right, so where we left off <coughs> on last class is right here. And just as a summary, using historical data, using the ratios, we had forecasted six years worth of financial ratios, which created six years <coughs> excuse me, of forecasted financial statements, which created six years of forecasted cash flows and economic profits. So picking up, we're going to add a new tab. So over here on the right, plus for a new tab, and make sure it's the last sheet in your model. So put it here at the end. And we're going to call this the DCF for discounted cash flow valuation tab. Okay, so it'll be the final tab in our model, which is basically aggregating the value, the forecasted valuation, intrinsic value for the company. All right, so I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. <laughs> And when we do this valuation, <coughs> instead of <coughs> forecasting, <coughs> excuse me, across the columns, we're actually going to forecast down the rows just so that we can print this out eventually on one 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. Okay. Be a little bit easier to print this way. So, following Medigliani Miller. All right, the first part of the valuation is the operating value. And what's going to drive the operating value is free cash flow. And the first year of forecasted free cash flow equals relative years. We grab it off our CFI <coughs> 2018. And we had arbitrarily forecasted six years. So the first five years equals 2018 plus one relative references going through 2022 will be what's known <coughs> as the defined forecast period. So this is the year-by-year -year individual forecast for free cash flow we got out of the model. So what we want to do is we want to capture those free cash flow forecasts from our CFI tab. So in 2018, our model had created a forecasted free cash flow for PVH. Go to the CFI tab, H12. Two thousand nineteen forecasted free cash flow from the CFI tab I twelve. Two thousand twenty J twelve. Two thousand twenty one K twelve. And two thousand twenty two forecasted free cash flow L twelve. 
and I'm going to go ahead and put those into dollars to represent our forecasted free cash flow for each of the next five years. All right, next step is we need to present value those free cash flows. So using the concept of a discount factor, these would be the discount factors. So if we multiply our free cash flow by the discount factor, we then get our discounted free cash flow. And to do a discount factor, we basically multiply the cash flow times 1 <coughs> divided by 1 plus r to the n or t, r being the cost of capital. So equals 1 divided by left paren 1 plus, and the cost of capital is on the assumptions tab, B4. So if we multiply free cash flow by discount factor, we get discount of free cash flow, 576.03. Okay. Now, as I copy this down, I want to make this an absolute reference. So dollar sign B, dollar sign 4. And for each of the years, do year 2. <coughs> it's 1 divided by 1 plus R squared. So shift 6, 2. For 2020, 1 divided by 1 plus R to the third power. Shift 6, 3, which used to be called the carrot. 1 divided by 1 plus R to the fourth power. And 1 divided by 1 plus R to the fifth power. So those are the five discount factors. And if I copy this down, these would be the five discounted free cash flows. Okay. So remember, for this model, we've arbitrarily chosen six forecasted years. These are the first five years, which we'll call the defined forecast period, where we're going to year by year forecast the free cash flow of, in this case, PVH. All right, and based on the WAC and based on the forecasted free cash flows, this would become, if I sum up the discounted free cash flows, this would become the operating value first five years. 25, 90, 76. Okay, so make sure you match that number as we go along. Questions about what we've done so far? All right, so as part of the valuation, we said, and the book said, that basically, you always forecast a N plus 1 or T plus 1 year, which is the beginning of the continuing value or terminal value period. In our case, that will be 2023. Okay, so the first five years are the individual years that we forecast. Year six is beginning a continuing value. All right, if we've done an 11 year model, the first 10 years would be the defined period. Year 11 would be continuing value or perpetuity, okay, or terminal value. So just always you do an N plus one year, okay? So that's what will be the next one, which will be our continuing value. And the continuing value is the key value drivers formula. So key value drivers formula, no plat times one minus G over ROIC divided by WAC minus G. So basically we need those four things to calculate <coughs> or estimate <coughs> continuing value. So therefore, on the assumptions tab, we're going to need, and I'll put it here, continuing value G. We're going to need a continuing value ROIC, and we're going to need a continuing value no plat. Those four things we're going to need to calculate our continuing value. I'm going to put those in yellow, because we're going to actually build the forecast from this page, okay? So we don't jump around all throughout the model. And our model has created some placeholders that we may choose to change. So for example, we might have a placeholder for ROIC, which is the representative ROIC into the future. So we might choose to change that number 
as we change our models. Okay, so I'm going to put that here as a changeable assumption. But I need some numbers to get started. So for G, we're going to just put it in a fall to 3%. Okay, I'll make both of these just a couple more decimal places so it's easier to change and see. But we're going to later, on Wednesday, talk more about how to estimate a more realistic G. But for now, we're going to use 3% as a placeholder for our G. Most U.S. mature companies are probably going to have Gs in the 2 to 3% range, mainly because generally if you grow with the economy, 2 to 3% is about what the U.S. economy tends to grow. Okay? That's what's grown at last 100 years is about 3%. Next, next 100 years, people are saying it's probably going to be closer to 2. So 2 to 3% Gs if you're maturing with the, company, the economy. But again, we'll talk more about that next class. Continuing value ROIC equals from the economic profit EOI tab, the end of your economic profit, there's a 2023 forecast ROIC. That would be row 15, column M. So M15 is the ROIC for 2023, which is what we're going to use for the starting con continuing value assumption based on end of year ROIC, around 8.3% right now. And then for the continuing value no plat off of the TII, 2023 no plat off the TII, row four, column M, M4, 735 million, 0.29. So those are the four components of the continuing value key value driver equation. All right, so from here, we're going to turn that into the continuing value assumption. So equals left paren, working all off the assumptions tab. No plat times left paren. <clears throat> One minus the growth, the G, B5, divided by the ROIC, B6, right paren, right paren, divided by left paren, the WAC, B4, minus G, B5. 940845. <clears throat> leave this on the screen for a second, but this is the key value driver equation with the correct order of operations, which is always important in Excel, to basically say this is the continuing value or terminal value for PBH going from 2023 into the future. Because again, the difference between a project and a company is we assume companies last forever, hence why we're using this as perpetuity. Questions about any of this? All right, the good news is the <coughs> terminal value formula, the continuing value, actually discounts for year 2023, okay? But we still have to bring it back to our present value. So this value, 94.845 is the value as of January 1st, 2023. So we don't want to make a common mistake and double discount 2023 because it's already been discounted. But we need to use the same discount factor to bring it back to our present value. So today, it would be B9 times C9, 6403.23. So that's the value of PVH from year six into perpetuity. 25, 90, 76 is the first five years. If we add them together, we get the overall operating value, which equals this plus this, 89.93.99. So assuming our assumptions come true, that is the free cash flow operating value of PBH going forward. Questions? Um, what's in the um, D9 real quick? Just, oh, Just got a present value that perpetuity because it. it's at the beginning of year six. We need to bring it back to today. Other questions? <clears throat> Okay, so operating value 
plus non-operating value equals enterprise value. All right, so we forecasted out the operating value. Now we're going to forecast out the non-operating value. Here is where TFI has helped you. So off the TFI equals. These were, from Bloomberg, the three non-operating categories. Excess cash, non-operating assets, net of non-operating liabilities, long-term investments. So we can pull these three. I can, since they're in a row, I can copy and paste. But these are the three line items for non-operating assets. Okay. So here's the thing. If we use the last reported value from the company, which is already in a present value, then that would be, again off the TFI, 2017 at this point was the last reported year. So G9. And again, I'll format this as dollars, two decimal places. So that if I were to add up the non-operating value today, it would be the sum of those three. So here's the assumption behind the assumption. Generally, with non-operating assets, it's not what companies do. Okay. They do operating things, they don't do non-operating things. So very few people are good at non-operating activities. So we'll just assume that all future non-operating activities are NPV zero. And so all that needs to be accounted for today is the current non-operating values. That's kind of the assumption behind what we're doing here. Okay. <clears throat> Obviously, if you ever decide to change something, you could. But this generally works out. Cash, well, cash is cash. That's pretty straightforward. Okay. Non-operating assets and non-operating liabilities. I don't think the accounts are going to distort that value too much on an accounting balance sheet. It's going to be close to book value. So the only thing that could be kind of weird here would be long-term investments or equity investments in another company. <clears throat> so, for example, a number of years ago, Microsoft bought a chunk of Facebook okay, before Facebook did an IPO. Well, that equity investment is now worth a lot of money, right? But on a Microsoft's balance sheet, you're never going to see that because the accounts don't let them mark it up. Okay? So they'll let you mark something down, but they won't let you mark something up. So here's the point. The PVH doesn't have any long-term investments. Right? But if they did, and they were worth a lot of money, they would be underrepresented by their balance sheet. So we need an adjustment factor to potentially adjust for this one category. So what we're going to do is on the Assumptions tab, we're going to call this the price to book multiple of long-term investments. And right now we're going to set it to one. We're going to make this yellow, something we can change. <clears throat> and we're going to take on the DCF, we're going to take our long-term investments and we're going to multiply it by the assumptions price to book multiple of the long-term investments. Okay, So here's the point. If it's worth eight times what I originally paid, I adjust the price to book multiple to eight, it will adjust the valuation tab of the model to be a more realistic valuation. Okay, If I don't know what it is, I at least have it at book value, which is price to book of one. Okay, And for PVA, it's at zero, so it's kind of a, a moot point for them. But since this is a reusable model, we're setting it up so we might actually have to adjust this depending on the company that we're valuing. That's how we would adjust to a market price the book value of the long-term investments. Okay. So if I take my operating value, 89.93.99, and I add my non-operating value, which is negative 495.16, I get my enterprise value forecast. Eighty-four, ninety-eight, eighty-three. So very quickly, based on the cash flows we created last class, we have set up a forecasted valuation of about eight and a half billion of enterprise value. All right. Now, following Manigliani Miller, we then have this enterprise value to pay off the debt and the equities, the threes and the fours. So here's the thing. Again, this is where TFI helps us. We're trying to get to a common equity value, 
So these are the debt, the re retirement related liabilities and interest bearing debt, and non common equity preferred and minority interest. Those are the four people that have to be paid off. Whatever's left is going to be common equity. They get, they're the last to be paid. Okay, so we need four of those five categories have to be paid off. So we're going to go back to our DCF and we're going to start paying off the non common liabilities and equity. So back to our TFI. We'll start with retirement related liabilities. I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to copy down all five. So this is double counting. We're solving for total common equity, but just so I can put them in order without copy and pasting multiple times, I put all five there. And same thing, I'm going to use the 2017 actual value. So go back to 2017. This is the current amount we owe each person. So these are G14. This is what they're owed today. Okay, or at least at the time of the filing. Again, copy and paste these four down. And then I'm going to take the common equity value and I'm going to delete this row. So I basically have the four items that have to be paid back. Retirement related liabilities, 8960. Interest bearing debt, 321640. They don't have any preferred stock and minority interest of $2 million. So if I take my enterprise value and I pay off those non-common debt and equity claims, what should be left should be a common equity value equals the sum or sorry D19 minus the sum of these four items 51 90 83 that is our forecasted equity value for PVH. Questions about how I got there? <clears throat> All right. So we know the equity value. Yes. I do have one question. The um, long-term investments and receivables are multiple. Mm -hmm. So for that, how long did you take? Was it TFI uh, to 11 times the assumptions stage? Yep, so times assumptions, B8, exactly. And we just left that as a 1.0 multiple, which means basically keep it what it is, which is book value. And it, again, it doesn't apply here to PVH, but since we're building a reusable model, this might apply to a different company, so that's why we're putting that in there now. Okay? All right, <clears throat> now, back to this. If we take our equity value, and we divide by shares outstanding. We then get a forecasted share price. So here's the thing. We need to know their shares outstanding. <clears throat> Quickest place to find shares outstanding currently for Bloomberg, because we're doing a value as of today. You go to Bloomberg, look up the company. PVH US equity. Type in DES for company description. Summary that Bloomberg told you is very valuable about key things that are going on with the company, but I like in DES right here in page one, down here at the bottom, current shares out. So it's just a quick way to get the current shares outstanding. Because we're doing the valuation as of today, right, we actually want to know the current share count, which is 76.9 million. Except I don't want to put it here. The reason why is because when I change this model, let's say we were doing L brands, they're not going to have 76.9 million shares. They're going to have a different share count. And if I put it here and I don't change it, I'm going to get a wacky share price for L brands. So we're going to go back to the assumptions tab and we're going to put the shares outstanding and that number is 76.9 million. That is another yellow cell. And off of the DCF valuation, I'm just going to refer to that number off the assumptions. Again, minimizing the places where I make changes. 
And that gets me a share price, which is the common equity value divided by the shares outstanding, 67.50. So hopefully everybody was able to follow this and hopefully everybody was able to get to a 67.50 share price. Anybody not get that? This again is being recorded, so you can always go back and check the video. Right. So here's the thing. In terms of the process of the model, like we actually have finished up a valuation of a company. We finished up the enterprise DCF. Right? But we're not done. We're actually just getting started because we did the easy part, which is making the math work. Right? Now comes the more important part, which is actually creating a realistic value for PVH. So a few years ago, uh, I brought in a Morgan Stanley sell side analyst. At the time, she was covering Caterpillar to guest lecture and teach the class. And she also brought in her model that they actually used at Morgan Stanley. And they actually do three models for every company. And at the time, Morgan Stanley was one of the few banks that was doing this, but now almost every bank does the same thing. And what she said was, what was becoming a more common practice on Wall Street is that when they do this valuation and their DCF looks a lot like this, basically it's called intrinsic value. Okay? And the idea is this is a 12-month stock price target. Okay? So they have to create a 12-month stock price, what I think the stock price will be, and based on intrinsic value, they do a DCF very similar to this. But she said what our investors were also asking us for is what they called the bull and the bear. Because right? they said if this is your target, investors wanted to know how high could it be in the next 12 months and how low could it be so give me a range and investors found that that was actually more important than the target share price because they wanted to know what the riskiness of the stock was going to be how many standard deviations could it actually have and what she also said which I completely agree with is just saying plus or minus 20 percent is one of the stupidest dumbest answers you could possibly give okay and you're not going to do stupid dumb things in this class because right? if you say the target price for is 67.50 plus or minus 20%, that doesn't help me. Because right? my next question to you as an investor is going to be, why plus or minus 20%? Why not plus or minus 15%? Why not plus or minus 25%? And then you could say, oh, well, I did some math on the historical stock price. And I'm going to say, well, what if the past doesn't predict the future? Could those numbers range change? So help me understand your assumptions behind the range. You're going to look stupid, and I'm going to go to Goldman Sachs. So basically, <coughs> here's the key. What she said, and I'm, my editorial commentary aside, is that what matters with the bull and the bear, it's not just the plus minus range, but what were the assumptions they came up with for that plus minus range. Meaning, we think it can get as high as 80, and here's what will lead to an $80 stock price. We think it can get as low as 40, and here's what will lead to a $40 stock price. So that's the standard of which I'm going to teach you to start working on. So you're going to create a range, right? And the range <coughs> is actually not just plus or minus a certain percent arbitrarily, right? It needs to be based on realistic assumptions. We're not going to finish that today. We're going to get to that in the next class. It'll be part of what we're doing, but that's what, three of our valuations. So for every company, you're going to do a target, valuation number one, Excel model one. You're going to do a bull and a bear, two more Excel files, and you're going to do something else that they don't teach you to do someplace else that I make you do in this class called an as is, file number four, okay? And the as is, is basically saying that right now, so we're gonna screenshot this, off the DES screen, PVH is trading snapshot 143.68 a share. So I'm going to take a screen snap, snapshot, save this. I'm gonna call it PVH-DES, and the reason I'm gonna do this is that you have not only the company, but you also have the Bloomberg code associated with it, which will be your map to recreate this in the future for the next company that you're assigned. Okay, so one of the screenshots you're always gonna need is the DES file, because it's gonna give you two things. One, it's gonna give you the current share count. And it's important because our valuation is as of today, it wasn't as of the date that the, the Q or the K was released, so the share count could have changed. So we need the share count based on today's price. That's why we're using the share count. The other thing is we need today's share price, right? So that's how we're going to do our as-is valuation. Question? Uh, 
<coughs> are those assumptions derived from supplemental data from equity research groups? Yes. Point, well, what you're going to find, and this is what a lot of the next half of the semester is, and you're either going to find this frustrating or fun, I consider this the fun part, <coughs> is that it's the qualitative side of valuation that makes a lot more impact than the quantitative side. Meaning the math is easy. And <coughs> the, the simple way of describing it is, what a lot of people do is they plug and chuck. I mean, they put the numbers in, and it spits out a stock price. But I also like to say garbage in, garbage out. Because if you just throw in some random assumptions, or even some historical assumptions that we go forward, that's the point. If PVH repeats what they did last year going forward, they're worth $67 a share. Right now, they're trading at 143 So clearly, the market doesn't think that they're just going to repeat their 2017 performance. And so that's why the next part is, how do we come up with more realistic assumptions for the future? That's where we're about to go next. And that's part of the process, right? And it's what I'll call the art of valuation. And to be honest with you, that's the harder part, right? Not the science. The science is pretty straightforward. It's algebra. We just did it. You guys did it in the last two classes. You built an enterprise class, enterprise DCF model. It's in front of you. It works. It's repeatable. But what makes it good is what we're about to do. And that's why I said, this is where fourth valuation comes in to help us with his first question. And I call it the as is. Meaning, at $143 a share, basically there are cash flows in the future that have to equal that price. Right? Otherwise that price doesn't exist. So here's the point. It's not do I agree with the stock price. The first step is not do I agree or disagree. The first step is let me try and explain it. So let's work backwards to figure out what the cash flows have to be to equal $143.70 stock price. And then let's figure out what the assumptions are that get those cash flows. That is called the as is. And that's where we're going to start. And that's a step most people skip. They'll go straight to the target and say, I'm going to give my opinion. And I'm not saying we're not going to give our opinion, but I think it's helpful to figure out what opinions are currently being made by people. And then we can decide whether we want to agree or disagree with them. So we're going to tease out what those opinions actually are. That's the as is, that's Excel file number four. So for homework four, you're gonna turn in four files. As is, target, bull, bear, and you're gonna do a write-up exploiting the core assumptions that change between each one. And that's a process you're gonna continue throughout the semester, and that's also your group project, okay? Except instead of 500 words, it's gonna be 5,000 words, okay? So that'll be the difference between your group project and basically the individual valuation, the level of assessment will be, you'll have a month to work on it rather than a day to work on it, okay? But that's actually why, if you think about PVH, why you did the first group project. Because what you did is you did the qualitative assessment of the industry and that should inform some of the decisions we're about to make here in the valuation. Yes? So, so then what we just did was the as is? No, um, it's actually gonna become the as is, but we gotta be more realistic. So here's the next piece. What assumptions do we have to make? Well, let's go back to our assumptions. Well, we got the right share count. That got us started. All right, now we know, and I'll use the screenshot, just because it's time sensitive. So for MD, 443, spring, PVH, this screenshot, 143.68. So here's what we're going to do. In our model, off my assumptions tab, <coughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, make it a little bit smaller. I'm going to put the current share price. <coughs> and I'm going to put the model share price. So the current share price as of the time of the valuation is 143.68. That is something that's yellow because that's something I'm entering. The model share price is not yellow and I'm going to reference it from my DCF valuation and that is 67.50. So the key to the as is is we want those two to be almost exact. Ideally exact, but I'll say if you're within a dollar, that's probably good enough, right? But that's the point. It can't be 67.50 against a 144 share price. That's not an as is. 
what we have to do is we have to explain the 143.68 share price. And again, just to reiterate, it's not whether or not I agree with the 144 share price. It's just what assumptions generate that price. That's what we're about to do. Okay, so let's go back to assumptions. One of the assumptions we need is we need a current whack because we had put in a placeholder whack and we need a more current whack. So where's our current whack? Well, if we go back to Bloomberg, WACC, 8.7%. Okay, so again, take a screenshot. And you don't have to take the screenshot right now, but this is one I'm going to take for you. So again, you will have PVH WAC as a screenshot, because as I said, I want you to have a screenshot of the three Bloomberg screens you're going to need to keep doing these assumptions over and over again. And this is screenshot number two. We need a current WAC for the company. So 8.7%. Let's put in 8.7%. And let's realize that 8.7 is actually worse for us because that makes the share price even lower. Now we're down to 54. We got to get to 144. Okay. But nonetheless, it is what it is. That's the current WAC. Right? Now, G we'll come back to. But basically, the next key piece is we're going to need to start getting more realistic ratios, more realistic growth rates, more realistic margins, etc. Now, before I, I give this to you, I also, since we're going to be changing this page, I'm going to make a reference to this share price just so that I also have this on this page. So that way I don't have to keep jumping around the model from page to page as I make changes to see what the share price changes. I change an assumption, I can see the change in share price immediately. I change <coughs> the uh, ratio, I see the share price change immediately. Okay. So nonetheless, I didn't make it yellow because I'm not making the model share price change here. I did that in the assumption, so it's just a relative reference. But nonetheless, it makes my life easier, so I don't keep jumping screen to screen. Ever see why I did that? Okay. So, back to this. Before we start changing the assumptions, I want to talk about what matters. When I gave you this model, I said there were three fields in gray. And I said, don't worry about it. I'll explain what they mean later. Well, now is later. So, these three things are the 90-10 rule of the most important things you can forecast for your valuation, right? Because operating value is really what matters. Got to forecast the operating value correctly, which means we got to forecast the free cash flow. So free cash flow, we can see this off of CFI. It's gross cash flow and gross investment. So we got to forecast gross cash flow. Well, here's the point. We forecast revenue, EBITDA tax rate, that's basically your forecast for gross cash flow. Those are the three most important drivers of no plat and therefore gross cash flow. That's why I picked those three. Okay? I'm not saying you can't forecast some of the other ones, but what I'm telling you is this is going to be critical to your forecast of gross cash flow and therefore forecasting free cash flow. The other thing is we have to forecast gross investment. Right? Gross investment is going to be based on reinvestment rate. Now, here's the other thing. When we forecasted the balance sheet, I said everything here was a percentage of sales. Okay, And I said it was for simplicity. But here's the other reason why all those balance sheet items, which are mostly the operating items in the balance sheet, are everything that's a percentage of sales. If revenue grows and the balance sheet's a percentage of sales, what happens to the balance sheet? it also grows. So basically what we've done is we've tied the growth in the balance sheet to growth in revenue. And so if the revenue grows and the balance sheet grows, the difference between those two balance sheets is how much investment the company's making. Okay. Now behind this is an important assumption. It's productivity. By tying everything as a constant percentage of sales, we're assuming productivity for companies are not changing. So what I mean by that is if we go to our ROIC chart, that this productivity, we're saying, doesn't change that much for most companies over time. Might change a little, but not a lot. Let's be more granular. If I were to unhide these ratios, which I had previously hidden just so it all fit on the screen, 
Look at accounts and notes receivable. 8%, 7%, 9%, 9%, 8%, 8%. Look at inventory. 14, 15, 16, 15, 16 and a half, 16. So what I'm saying is there's not a giant shift in the amount of inventories they have. There's not a giant shift in the PP they have. It's not a big change. So that means the productivity, and this is true for most established companies, tends to stay fairly stable over time. So that's the point. We don't have to forecast big changes in productivity because we've tied a constant productivity to the growth rate, and that essentially backs into the gross investment. So we're basically saying that the reinvestment rate's gonna probably stay the same. Now here's where this breaks down. If we saw a dramatic change in productivity, where going forward, PVH closed a bunch of stores and they just sold online, well then we'd have to go back here and adjust the balance sheet ratios. All right, but for most companies, I'd say eight out of 10, nine out of 10, especially big established ones, which are the ones you're gonna be focusing on the semester, you probably don't have to muck around with the balance sheet. So what I've done is I've simplified most of your valuation to three numbers. Growth rate, EBITDA margin, tax rate. Get those right, you get most of your valuation right. Those are the most important assumptions to tease out. That's where we're gonna start. So we need a realistic tax rate, okay? So here's the point. We already established in the last class that the historical tax rate is not the tax rate going forward. So we need to know what the tax rate is going forward. Again, Bloomberg, EVT is the event calendar. They're about to have a conference call on the 21st of March. Today, unfortunately, is what, March 5th? So we still need to know what the tax rate's gonna be. On their last conference call, if we go through this transcript, now this is a feature you don't have in your Bloomberg terminal that Bloomberg enabled for me that's a paid feature called Transcript Analyzer. You just have to do this manually. So what I can quickly do here, and you can do the same thing, is for a single security, PVH, these are the transcripts of those previous earnings calls. I can actually type the keyword here as opposed to downloading and searching in a PDF, and I can type in tax rate, and here's every mention of the word tax rate in every one of those calls. So I can see that Mike Schaefer in the last earnings call said our tax rate for the year is planned at about 165 to 17%. Okay, so what you would have done is you would have gone to the third quarter call, you would have opened up the PDF, and you would have found that. <clears throat> okay, I got a little bit of a shortcut, <clears throat> but nonetheless, it's the exact same process. So we know that PBH is guiding analysts to 165 to 17% for the tax rate. So what number do we want to use in the model? Do you want to use 16 and a half? Do you want to use 17? Do you want to use 16.75, the average? Let's, let's do the middle, 16.75. By the way, this is where, as an analyst, you start to make your money, is that we're just splitting the difference arbitrarily. If we're good, we should know whether it's closer to 16 or 17, or you know somewhere outside that range if we think it's actually changing. But nonetheless, 16.75, it's a pretty tight range. We'll probably use that. Okay, so now the share price, 57.66, went up a little bit. Still got a big gap to go. Next, we're going to need a realistic revenue growth rate and a realistic EBITDA margin, which goes back to outside of doing the assessment that you did the first week of class as a group project, is anybody here an expert? on the fashion industry and particularly PVH. Right? I didn't think so. Which means that coming up with the actual revenue forecast, do we think we're going to do better than the professionals who cover PVH for a living? Probably not. But here's the advantage of a real world class. Let's leverage what they do. Where can we actually see the forecast for growth rate from the analysts? In Bloomberg. What screen? <clears throat> EEO. Earnings estimate overview. This is your critical screen. Because on this screen, this is a real time view of the consensus estimate database of the ANR. These analysts, the 17 of them that cover PVH, 
are basically updating their forecast. By the way, here's their target stock price, 160.20, which is where we're going to go on Wednesday, creating our own target stock price, and the buy, sell, holds associated with them. And notice every analyst doesn't agree at 160, like Buckingham is at 176, Namura is at 150, Piper Joffrey is 173, Barclays is at 166, Morningstar, who I don't really like in the analyst world, I, I'd say ignore them. Of all the analysts, they're at 135. Why? It's a good question. Why do I not like the Morningstar analysts? And it's nothing against Morningstar as a company. They hire really smart people. Backwards. Morningstar bases most of their research on historical data. Right? So when Morningstar says hold, I don't buy it as much because, yes, based on historical data, it doesn't look so good. And they use historical data to predict the future. So that's my problem with Morningstar. Just out of curiosity, how do you know that? How do I know that? Yeah, just out of curiosity. Because I've, I've read their research. And there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal, which I quoted in my LinkedIn profile, that said when a company is rated by five stars by Morningstar, it actually doesn't equal five-star performance in the future because five-star Morningstar performance is based on historical data. So even when they do the funds, the, uh, the five-star funds don't outperform in the future because past performance does not predict future performance. But that's Morningstar's philosophy. Like, they believe that by the past, you could predict the future. And so they rate you based on how you've done in the past. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with keeping score, but to me, the past doesn't predict the future. And that's why I discount Morningstar's research compared to the other analysts. That's my personal opinion. You could choose otherwise. I'm not saying to go, not to go work for them. But what I'm also telling you is we are future weighted in this class. Yes? Oh, uh, how did you get to the analyst A&R. Okay. What I'm saying is these analysts, including Morningstar, all right, are basically putting together an Excel file not too dissimilar to what you guys just did. And they're uploading it to Bloomberg. Yes? In your experience, then, what would you say is like, uh, like, who do you trust the most for like research? Good question. It's not the firm. It's the analyst. Because you can have idiots working for Goldman Sachs. I'm saying it's less likely, but nonetheless, you don't, it's not the firm. And it's basically the analyst. So you can also have like a second tier firm, but have a really bright analyst. So in Wall Street, they tend to follow the analyst, not the firm. And so that's what matters. And so when I work with a company, I am fortunate through my position to get access to the head of investor relations or the CFO. One of the first things I'll say, who are the analysts that you respect? Give me those names because those are the reports <clears throat> that I deal with. So, for example, tomorrow I got to call Toby O'Brien, who's the CFO of Raytheon. I'm getting ready to do a course for Raytheon in a few weeks for their senior execs. So, one of the first things, hey Toby, basically, which analyst report should I be paying attention to? Because they know, they know who understands their business better, and that's the point. They know who the investors think understands their business better, and that's far more important than just saying, oh, you know, this guy from Nomura works for a great firm. Well, he might actually not know as much about the industry as some of the others. And what some of these people do is they copy the good ones, right? I actually was working with a firm where they actually said that that happened. So I won't name the firm because I'm doing this on a YouTube video. But basically, I was in the audience <coughs> with the senior leaders, and they had Fidelity in the room. And we asked Fidelity, like, who you respected and who you didn't respect. And they actually talked out of shop and they said who they didn't respect. And they named a firm. And the reason they said they did work with that firm was not because they thought the analyst was good, but because the analyst would get them tickets to Pebble Beach anytime they wanted to play Pebble Beach. And so they threw some business to that firm just so that the Fidelity people could always play Pebble Beach whenever they wanted to. Okay. And I'm just telling you, this is what actually happens on Wall Street. Okay. Nobody wants to know how the sausage is made and all the other conflicts of interest. We, you know, that, that never happens. But, <clears throat> but the point is, they would never listen to the analyst when he said buy, sell, hold. Okay, so they just basically get some institutional research dollars, a little trading their way, just so that they can actually play golf. But everybody in the street knows, and here's the reason why, what that analyst does is he, they know that he just copies the other spreadsheets and adjusts it a little bit, but he doesn't do any real work. So therefore, he keeps his job because he's in the middle of the pack, but nobody respects him because he's actually not doing any independent research. Right? By the way, that analyst doesn't work at that firm anymore. Right? So you can last for a year or so just kind of being a copycat, but it still catches up with you in the real world. Now, that's a separate class. In the interest of time, here's what matters more. These analysts create these forecasts. 
So here's the key to this forecast. I don't think we're going to do a better job than these analysts who basically cover PVH for a living in forecasting PVH going forward. So this is the consensus estimate for the 2018 revenue that's going to be recorded, reported on what, March 23rd? This is what they expect today. These are the number of analysts that are in that recommendation. So 15 of those analysts uploaded their spreadsheets. One was a mathematical outlier, which Bloomberg threw out. And 14 of them were in the range 8.743 billion to 8.801 billion. The average was 8763. That's how the consensus is actually created. Okay. And by the way, two analysts re-uploaded their spreadsheet in the last four weeks, and they averaged the average went up by seven million because those analysts re-uploaded their spreadsheets. All right. So here's what I want you to look at. Look at the number of analysts forecasting revenue in the forward years. What's this number? 2018. How many analysts? 14, 14, 14, 14, 11, 13. By the way, you can scroll out a year. 2022. Okay. Why do you think you see such a big drop off here? Because I'll tell you, every one of those analysts has a forecast going out at least five years. But why don't you see it in Bloomberg? They don't. They don't want to um, give away their cards, right? They, they might have inside information, but also they might not. Well, I wouldn't say if they have inside information or giving away their cards, yeah. but they don't want to have information that makes them look foolish. Yeah. Because once I get past two or three years, it gets much, much harder to forecast any company. And if I put my data out there, it's tracked. And that's the point. Everything that they upload to Bloomberg is tracked. And Bloomberg is going to score you on what you said versus what the company eventually did. So what you'll see is, even though every one of these analysts have a spreadsheet model which goes out just like we do, generally they, they'll keep it themselves, and if you're proprietary, maybe I'll show it to you, but I don't want to put it publicly facing because it could make me look bad. So what I'm going to say is, two years for any publicly traded company, you'll see this as we go through the semester, it's pretty heavily forecasted, and then it drops off. I'm not saying you can't use some of the out years to help you do three, four, and five, but what I'm telling you is just recognize that if we do year five for PVH, we're relying on a couple of people who may not necessarily be the best forecasters, and we're just getting their early swags. So at that point, I'm less thinking that that's less likely to happen than what's coming out in three weeks, that 15 analysts have a pretty good idea and a pretty narrow range upon. So here's the thing. Because we're not experts, and these people are experts, let's use this to help us in our model. So here's how we're going to do this. First, I'm going to take a screenshot. This is screenshot number three you'll need for every company. So save PVH EEL. I need my revenue and I need my EBITDA forecast for the next two years. So what I'm going to do is in the assumptions tab, equals 2017 plus one and then plus one. So my next two years, I need my forecast, spell here, forecast for sales, and I need my forecast for EBITDA. So what is my forecast for sales next year? 92.29. For 2019, consensus 96.68. The consensus for EBITDA for 2019 is, uh, oh, sorry, I want 2018. Let me go back. I forgot I moved it forward here. Okay, so 87.63. Make sure I get my years right. And because I moved it forward here, 92.29. EBITDA is 1139 and 12.62. And these four fields should be yellow. 
and currency. So hidden in plain sight, the other way around, equals EBITDA divided by sales. This, for the next two years, is the EBITDA margin forecast for PVH, 13 and then 13.7. So here's the thing. For my ratios, I don't want to actually directly forecast here what the consensus is done. So I'm going to not make those yellow anymore. I'm going to take the fill out. And for 2018 equals this 13 consensus estimate EBITDA margin. And the 14, I'm sorry, 2019 is the 13.7% consensus EBITDA margin for the firm. See what I just did? So instead of directly forecasting EBITDA margin, we just pulled the EBITDA margin out of today's consensus because we know the EBITDA dollars and we know the EBITDA sales, so we know the EBITDA margin, which is dollars of EBITDA divided by sales of EBITDA is our EBITDA margin. And so I don't want to change it here because I actually changed it there. If I wanted to do a third year, I could actually do a 2020 a third year if I wanted to, okay? Which, by the way, if I were to do that, uh, plus one, it goes to, now remember there's less analysts doing this, but it is 1346 and... 9668. Which I can make this yellow. Thirteen nine. Okay. So basically what the analysts are doing is they're actually forecasting an increase in EBITDA margin for the next three years. Now, I didn't actually change this to 13.9 because what you'll tend to see is for a lot of companies, the drop-off occurs between years two and year three. So I'll let this be subjective to you whether or not you want to include the year three. Okay, But in this case, let's make this 13.9. So let's go to ratios equals, and I'm going to still leave this as yellow because you may not want to do what I just did for that third year. And that's what I mean by look at the company because some companies just don't have a lot of forecasts starting in year three. So whether it's year three or year four is the drop off, the first two years are the most heavily forecasted. Okay. So just as an example, I told you about Raytheon. Here's Raytheon. Eighteen, nineteen, thirteen, two. Here's Ford. Seventeen, seventeen, seven, one. Notice for auto, there's a much bigger drop off in year three. It goes from 17 to seven, all right? So for Raytheon, the drop off was really in year four. For Ford, the drop off is really in year three. So that's why I said subjectively, you'll still see pretty heavily forecast by all the analysts in the first two years. So that's what you're just gonna anecdotally see for most companies, all right? So therefore, used to third year discretionary, but at least it gives us an idea. By the way, our share price is now at 62. Next, we need a revenue growth rate. For revenue growth rate, here's the point. I know the revenue here. So for the next three years, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take the first two, I'm gonna kill the fill, and the forecast for 2018 revenue growth rate is current year minus previous year divided by previous year. So for my current year for 2018 equals assumptions B11 minus my previous year income G3, right paren, divided by G3. For 2010 equals left paren, 2019 minus 2018, divided by 2018. So for the next two years, 
the analysts are predicting growth rates of 7% and then 5%. If I wanted to go out the third year, equals left paren 20 minus 19 divided by 19, and then 5 thereafter. Okay? As I said, this one's more optional, but at least the two are consensus. That's why I'm not changing this one from yellow. But following the third year, these would be the consensus for the next three years. And by the way, now I'm at 84 a share. A little bit closer. Questions? Scroll to. Yeah, with rounding, but yeah. So again, it's current year minus previous year. Whatever you get divided by previous year is the formula for percentage change. So I'm just basically saying if we use the consensus, then we can back out essentially what the growth rate of the analyst expectations are. So another way of doing this, that 6.8, if I go back to Bloomberg, if I switch to the, well, PVH, I've got to switch to PVH. If I go to PVH, EEO, then for growth rate, I can look at a revenue growth rate, 6.8, 5.3, right? But nonetheless, we're just back solving based on these numbers, okay? Because we know last year and we know the next two years. <clears throat> Questions about where we got to today? Can you just summarize that, that last step? You mean about the revenue growth rate? So for 2019, because I put both revenues off the EEO on the assumptions tab, so it's the 2019 forecasted sales minus the 2018 sales, which was a forecast, divided by the 2018 sales forecast. So basically, the key to putting those percentages in is this should be 92.29 in this income statement. This should be 96.68 in the income statement. So we just back solve for the percentage that match those numbers. So now I'm closer to the consensus, in this case, for the next three years on the income statement. All right. Now, we still have to talk about years four and five and the perpetuity values, but you'll notice that our share price is a little closer at $84 a share. All right. So this is where we're stopping today. Right. And in our next class, we'll pick up from here, and then we're going to basically make the other adjustments because there's just too many to make in the short period of time we have left. All right, so we'll do that to finish out the as is, and then we'll talk about creating a target, a bull, and a bear. All right, and then once we get there, you'll have four Excel files, because we'll just save the as is, create the target, save the target, create the bull, save the bulls, create the bear, and then those will be the four files that you'll upload next Monday yeah. for homework four. Yes? Can you show the formula for PV multiple? I just put it as one. It's just one. So basically, just leave it at book value, multiply by one, unless we think the market value is different. All right, so uh, I recorded this as a video. I'll post it up to YouTube. Uh, feel free to stop by before you leave class if you want to check anything on my screen. Otherwise, save this file. Bring this file exactly where it is to class on Wednesday. We'll pick up here on Wednesday's class. Okay? No homework between now and Wednesday because this is part of the homework. So hopefully you got to, again, the key number, 8350. If you're not at 8350, please see me before you leave. We'll help you get to 8350. Okay?